Right. Okay. So um, a little bit about me. Um, I've been doing this since 2005, and I'll come directly to that. But uh, I've been working with sound in this way that I'm going to explain since 2005. Before that, I was playing guitar for in rock bands and stuff since teenager teenage years, and um, I was starting to make more atmospheric music, let's say, and kind of soundtracky stuff. But got really really sick of almost everything that I was doing and then a lot of things I was hearing as well. And I was really looking for something different. Um, and I was also in a professional capacity, I was a model maker. So I was working more with my eyes and my hands. And so actually getting into the sound work was the complete removal of that. I could actually, I felt like I could do the two things in tandem. Like it was actually very, very moved. Um, so, 2005, I was invited to join three artists who were all based in Bristol, where I was at the time. And we took a research trip to Iceland that was actually quite well supported somehow. Um, the, there were two visual artists that actually wrote to a lot of places that tried to exchange art for, for, um, for favours, like a place to stay and even car hire, I think, at one point. So just, I got invited on this amazing trip. I'd never been to Iceland before. I didn't even really know what to expect. And well, as you'll hear, it, it completely changed my life. So I'm going to just play one of my early recordings from that trip. Um, so, OK, so let me explain that the three artists I was invited with, um, they, they were all visual artists. There was a photographer, a filmmaker, and a, um, a painter. And so I was invited pretty much as a musician to, to gather material. And then if the results of the research trip actually then resulted in anything, um, like, a, like a gallery show or anything or an exhibition, then I would be composing some kind of musical or sound wallpaper to tie all the pieces together. It was definitely that I was the extra spoke on the wheel or something. But then as I kind of explored what was going on with uh, the, the situations that we found in Iceland, then um, it just became very clear that, that, um, that this, was, this was about the journey and this was about the experience of being there. So it was actually a very equal part of the project. Um, I'm just going to play this first recording that you can probably see on the screen right now. It's called Vic Transition. It's a town called Vic. And as Stuart was mentioning earlier, this was something that I, I didn't know a lot about, about sound recording for a start and field recording. But I actually managed to record this sound almost in one take. So I'll just play it now. Uh, you might have to adjust your volume level for it. it I think it, it fades in, but it gets quite loud. So just uh, watch your ears.
<laughs> so this was um, a little town called Vik. We drove as far as we could away from artificial light pollution so that the visual artists could capture the aurora. But it meant that we ended up in these quite remote areas uh, with a lot uh, with very little background sound. So this recording was actually me. I found a, a place where um, there was a stream that was kind of flowing in under what just looked like a huge snow field. So you could see that it actually go down underneath and then come out at another point. So what I did was almost exactly what Stuart was saying, but with uh, very rudimentary gear, I dropped the microphone down, hoping that it wouldn't go in the water. Uh, but you can actually hear that movement as well, where it actually moves down across from the snow, close to the snow to then some kind of cavity where the water's actually flowing underneath. And then it, there's this kind of blend to then the other side of that. So I'm actually giving you like this little sonic journey as well from one end to the other. Um, the, the reason that I was getting fed up with music as such was the kind of the rhythms that I was hearing or overhearing. And when I started to get into listening to especially water recordings, but other, other recordings of the environment or sounds of the environment, um, there are rhythms there. There are quite obvious rhythms there, but they're not, it's kind of regular rhythms. They can become that sometimes, but very often then they're not these regular rhythms which is something that I, I really gravitated towards at the beginning. And I definitely have kept since then, like for the last 15 years, I've been struggling to, to kind of keep to that path. Um, and it was just a new way of finding, even just discovering sounds. Uh, before, as I say, I was playing guitar. So I was trying to find new sounds within a guitar and, and found that extremely difficult actually um, without loads of effects and things like that so actually going out into the environment and even then moving around and just just in a tiny little location finding these incredibly like a, a rich wide variety of sounds just in this tiny little area that that really excited me to 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 be this kind of hunter um and then i'll play the, the second sound which is i always play this at the start of any workshops or anything because it's still it is one of the most important recordings for me um so th this one i realize now is also very important with the, the position of the microphone actually changing the sound you moving a microphone completely changes the sound you hear it sounds obvious but it really isn't to a lot of people um and then i'll just play this second track but i'm not going to tell you what it is um, in the chat, I'd like you to write what you think it is. And then we're going to have a break after hopefully about another 15 minutes, but I'm already waffling. So I'm going to try and keep things more brief, but then we'll, we'll, we'll actually see what people thought it was. And then I'll explain what it is. And then I'll tell you why it was important. So.
Okay, so I'm going to talk, while you write down what you think that is, I'm going to continue to talk. Um, so this was one of my, this was my first trip doing this kind of thing, but I realized I, I just, this was something I was really, I, like all of the energy that I put into being in a band or putting into music, I was definitely going to, going to pursue this more. While in Reykjavik, at the very end of the trip, I found a tiny little record store with a section downstairs full of experimental music and sound stuff that I'd never seen or heard before. And I found a whole section on field recording and I realized that there was a whole community of people out there. I didn't even know about this, the size and scale of this worldwide community until I went to that record store. So that was, that was like a big signifier. Like that, that's what I mean, that whole trip just completely changed everything for me. Um, I kind of decided that I wanted to go to more remote places and kind of go and collect these sounds as little gems and hidden treasures and stuff, and bring them back to, to the world, almost like safari or something, but one that doesn't kill animals. Um, and so through this, through finding this community, sending a lot of work out to like even just raw recordings to a lot of artists that at the time and even now were very prominent. Um, I was lucky enough, I'm going to skip quite a lot now to 2002 and um, I had an invitation to go to the Amazon rainforest in Brazil um, with uh, the invitation of an artist called Francisco Lopez who is very well known for his field recording and concrete music work. Um, it costs a lot of money to go and so I really had to, I needed to apply for some funding for it from the Arts Council. Um, I went to a meeting about this and I found out that I would have to present the work a great deal on my return in the UK, which I managed to, to find many opportunities to do so. And so I was lucky enough to get the funding to, to go to the, the rainforest and we were deep in the Brazilian rainforest for two weeks, no contact with the outside world. 12 people recording sounds, it's very intense, but very, can I say enjoyable? Just very, I know, again, life-changing though. Yeah, intense. And I've met some very good people who are still friends through that. Um, so through 2008, I actually, I'm gonna play a sound from that first, just so I don't keep talking so much. So I'm just going to play, uh, so one of the points or one of the, the results of this, uh, the residency was that even while we were there, we were going to compose a piece that we were then going to play to the other artists and then critique it to, to each other. Or, you know. so, um, so this is a little section of my piece that I then, and it's a section of work that I then took to many different places, performing uh, in install, as presented in installation, um, uh, and it, or it was also released online as an album um, throughout 2008. Okay, so come back to this. This. What I was trying to do there was, I realized 
quite early on that the, the jungle doesn't get quiet really at any time, apart from right in the middle of the day when it's the hottest time and everything really does kind of calm down and get quieter. But we were out at like 24 hours a day, we were out recording like in all different places. We were actually um, on the banks of a lake. So we were going across the lake to other places and then into the jungle and around. Um, and so this recording is actually almost like a time compression of day and night. There's, 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 there are nocturnal animals. These animals would never meet normally. So it's, a, it's like a mix of those two. But then you hear sudden sounds in there as well that I really wanted to put in there. And they were basically things flying at the microphone that I was using, which was a, a very directional microphone, shotgun microphone, that it would actually fly at the, the microphone and then pass by. So you just hear something coming up and then nothing, um, which is a trick that you hear in a lot of experimental music with people bringing things into the uh, crescendo or something but these were like naturally happening as, as I was recording, which I just really loved. I actually over accentuated it and put, put them back in a couple of times, but because I liked the effect. Um, there's a lot, I mean, I, I, like I said, there's a lot to say about all of these projects, but I'm just trying to kind of give you an idea of what stages I went through to, to get where I am now. So I mentioned that I had to sh um, show the work, I had to present the work for a, over a year afterwards, after that trip, every time I, I showed it, I exhibited it, I presented it in all these different places um, and, and in different ways, it kind of made less and less sense in the place that it was, um, especially when I was performing with the work. So I'd actually use these sounds to create another version of that soundscape that you heard. And it's sometimes more dynamic and sometimes really chilled out. Um, and so I think I proposed to the Collision Festival in London, I think it's still going actually in Peckham, um, to, to present this work or a work from Iceland and they accepted both. But then when I got there to have a meeting with them, I realized that it didn't make any sense and I actually wanted to make something that was about there. Um, and the, the site was actually overlooked by the Peckham Library that make a note that if you go if you have a look at this it's a it's a huge building that kind of goes up and then outwards like a, a big shelter or something and it's copper plated on the side so it's it's kind of it's got this bird degree thing and it's right in the middle of peckham so it's just this big land landmark um so i made some recordings in there and around the outside of it and then made a work to present for the festival which I'll play a little bit of now. And this is making it obvious that I'm composing much more and actually changing the sounds a lot more as well. So let me come back to...
um, just a little bit about that piece. Um, I had the idea before I went there that the library is this stereotyp stereotypical place where if you make any sound, you get told to be quiet. And, and it was the noisiest place I've been. It was, no, it was louder than some cafes I've been in. There were people talking, there was computers clacking away, there was like the thumping of the, the stamp on the books. It, it was just really noisy. So I do have, some, in that work, I have some ambient sounds that you, could, that you would hear if you were there. But I also recorded a lot with a uh, contact microphone, which is the sound that you, you said, a microphone you take the, the vibrations directly from an object or a surface. So you don't get the ambient sound um, or the space. Uh, but also a, what's called a telephone pickup coil. Don't even know if I have one sitting right here, but uh, they were used to listen to old handsets to listen to the actual coil of the, the, um, the handpiece. So you could actually record a conversation, but um, it actually doesn't work that well with a mobile phone because you just get all this interference and stuff from all the other things that are happening. And some of those sounds toward the end, towards the end were actually, they were, things I found in, because I got access all the way around, so I was actually sort of backstage in the library as well, and there were all these kind of swipe card kind of modules and things like that. So this kind of crackling sound is actually the electromagnetic uh, frequencies coming from those devices and from the computers and things like that. So I mixed a lot of those sounds that you wouldn't normally hear into that, that soundscape that I made from that piece. That really started me to, to want to do more site-specific work. It, it, it actually gave me a very big push to make things very much faster, very much quicker. So moving swiftly onwards, the next year, um, I also wanted to do a lot of work with, uh, with other artists. Um, I, I really felt inspired by being in groups of artists. So I applied to, to take part in a performance art um, it was going to be. It was going to be about site-specific work. So I didn't realize there was such an emphasis on on performance art. But it was a, a residency in Estonia, in an old plastic factory. Um, I will quickly go over that because it was not Again, it was a great experience. But um, I, I actually wrote a note to myself as well. I, I didn't really understand performance art even after a, a week and a half of being there. I, I, I yeah. But um, but the dedication. From, from the, the British artists that went, uh, and one Japanese artist, and from the Estonian artists that I met, their dedication to their art and, and their, their devotion to it was just really inspiring. Um, I was still, work, as I say, working as a model maker then, but I, I realized that I really wanted to, to have a much more, a, a bigger balance of art and, and the art life in my life than just be working and then do it in my spare time. Um, so that led me to be invited back the next year, but to do my own residency. So I was there for three weeks that time. Uh, took the, the opportunity to travel around a little in um, Estonia and a little in Latvia. And I met uh, John Grisnik, who is an American who's living in Estonia with his wife, Evelyn Merset. I probably spelled, I probably said her name completely wrong. I apologize to her for that. But they've remained friends since then. And, and John especially is, is very inspirational to me. Um, I will get Stuart to send you a link to his work because you'll, you'll see he's visionary. Um, but it was the first time I was also asked to do workshops. I had to give something in return for, for being given a place to stay for three weeks which was totally fine, but I've never given a workshop before. Did a little bit of research about what people do with listening and sound recording workshops, uh, but also what excited me. So we did some listening exercises. The first day of the workshops, um, we had blindfolds. We had quite a large group, I think 10, there's not 10 people there, but we had 10 or 12 people. And so we split them in two. And so one person was sighted and one person was blindfolded. And then the blindfolded person would walk in the city and then the sighted person would just really take care of them, look after them, make sure they didn't trip over things, walk into things. But it had to be very quiet as well. If they, if they, they I, 
we had a no speaking rule. So of course, some people did, but it was only in like necessary uh, situations. So um, we did a little walk around the city through the, some of the main streets. So you can see they actually gravitate towards things that if you were sighted, you probably wouldn't go and get any closer to. <laughs> this was quite interesting. But the second day was more interesting to me because it was actually raining and people didn't want to go out walking in the street. And as I say, we were in this old plastics factory. So we actually broke into a disused part of it and we took the, the um, participants and then we blindfolded them and we split them in two groups uh, on two. So it was one group on each of two floors. And then there were four of us looking after them to make sure they didn't again, trip over things or, but we just let, just let them go, let them explore. And this was really exciting. The, the way they actually explored the space, you could really tell that they knew when they were getting close to things like walls, windows, even sometimes someone could actually, I hope they weren't able to see, but they could almost tell that they were going to trip over something or walk into something. And that's the man himself. That's John Grisnick showing, um, another kind of microphone. These are binaural microphones that you would hear by, hold on, should I come out of this? So binaural microphones, they record from the point of the, the vantage point of the ears. So then when you hear the recording, it's almost like you're actually there. It, it's, it's a 3D effect for headphones or like a realistic effect for headphones. It, it actually works very well and that so he was showing there that one guy like even sat one one seat away he could tell that he was actually hearing a different part of the room so it kind of shifted his perception a little um okay so let's skip on from there but just to say that i've been back to um estonia and worked with john and evelyn many times since then early on from 2011 until 2013 i was in at, um, Colombia a few times so the first time was to give a workshop another uh, but a longer workshop this time I was invited by a, a, an artist friend of mine David Velez uh, he invited me to give workshops for two weeks for the master's program so they, it was the media art and plastic art um, department and so uh, my workshop was part of their actual master's uh, program which I didn't know until a long time afterwards. But um, so we explored the local area with listening exercises with blindfolds and then without blindfolds and then um, with small recorders. Um, I'm not sure if we were using, I don't think we were using contact mics then, but a couple of people had them. So they borrowed ours. Um, and at the end of it, they actually all made their own compositions. Um, this began my short love affair with Colombia. <laughs> and so I went back in 2012 for a short time. And then 2013, I was invited to get involved in this project that I'm going to show you now. These workshops were for groups of children across the city. There were five of us foreign artists invited. And then we worked with one local person each who would show us around and know, know the groups already as well because they, they were running the project still by then. So it was over 10 weeks. It was seven groups a week and they would, the, the sessions would last three hours uh, each time. And um, I can honestly say that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done, working with largish groups of kids seven days a week. I, I have total uh, respect for teachers total respect for teachers for being able to do, do, being able to do this. Um, so what we did was we had um, began with listening exercises where I played some of my own field recordings and some of other people's. Um, and then the, the children just, uh, they drew what they thought they heard or they, they drew moods or they, they just sometimes went actually quite abstract. So this is a, another area. You can probably see this is a little poorer. So um, this, this one actually, and one of the others, I, I was sent 
as the obvious foreigner to some of these more dangerous areas um, for, for various reasons. Just, I would be left alone, basically. Um, so I got, I got to meet all of these kids from loads of different um, social strata. So they, they're uh, doing the workshops. Then we had some, um, some more listening exercises. That's Juliana in the middle. And she's actually pausing and then asking what they can hear and then asking how they feel and, um, and various other things. Um, my Spanish was pretty terrible even then. So um, she was kind of doing most of the engagement. Uh, this is another one of the sketchy areas. These guys were great. Uh, it's a little bit older, as you can see. Uh, we made some kinetic sculptures, which do look like mobiles, but we, we just used random things we found in the street and uh, or in street markets and some things that they had lying around in each of the, of the centers that we were doing these things in. Uh, this is exploring with tiny little microphones, the Lavalier type that you see most people on TV wearing, but I and many other people use them to put them inside places where you can't put larger microphones and where you definitely can't put your head. So you can put them in these small places that, and you hear these kind of internal resonances that sound, they, they filter the sound very much. So it almost sounds like a musical tone when you hear something like this. These guys are doing it again, this is another group. And they're actually putting it down into a drain. Then we went on to the contact microphones. So they're recording the, the cables there. And I had played a sound of some ants that I recorded. And so they wanted to do that and try as much as they could to record this poor little ant. Uh, then we built hydrophones, which are microphones you can hear underwater with. And so in some places we had a stream nearby so we could actually go and record sounds of the water very easily. In other places we had to search to find places that were there things that had water sources and sounds. And this I'll come to in the next section, but this is a, this is something that is taken from um, uh, a guy called Nicholas Collins. Uh, he has a very comprehensive and amazing book called Handmade Electronic Instruments, I think. And one of his handmade instruments is to make a jumping speaker, which is making a connection with the speaker and a battery. So the speaker actually jumps when the connection is made. And so from here, we actually made this kind of uh, network of speakers that would actually then make each other jump. So one person would actually make theirs jump and then all of the others should be able to or should be jumping as well. Uh, so that was a nice little challenge. And the workshop sessions ended in building what are known as acoustic laptops. So these boxes with various um, objects, everyday objects attached inside. Um, it's pioneered by a Norwegian artist. Uh, I'm probably saying his name completely wrong as well, but it's Ture Honore Bu. Uh, he actually lives in Spain, but he's Norwegian and he is very well known for, for giving workshops and making these boxes. So, and I did ask his permission before I did this. And we had a, oops, sorry. We had a big final presentation in an auditorium that was arranged by the, the organization. So we had a lot of all of the groups I think came with their boxes and then in the center you can see we have two mixing desks I think there were 48 channels each so we had what a lot of noise that day <laughs> a lot of noise 96 boxes so um, I'm gonna come out of that and we're gonna have a short break from me talking So I'm just asking everyone to unmute so we can have a little chat. I was wondering, might it be possible, uh, we've had a couple of people join a little bit into it that wouldn't have heard your two samples earlier. And there's okay. the, one, the one that we were all guessing. I wonder if you could play that one again, just for those Absolutely. two to have a little, um, Absolutely. Have a little yeah. guess. Thank you. 
who was it that couldn't that didn't have headphones was it jane uh, <laughs> was how was that that sound lovely yeah you could still hear it fine okay oh, yeah. i heard yeah. everything i think of course, okay I, I probably didn't hear half of it <laughs> there's some quite low sounds in there so yeah, yeah. Okay. all yeah. right mm. um, so we had a we had a few guesses so we had um a gangplank some sort of pulley system hmm. big metal cables fishing nets ah and I, then i don't know then ian suggested something but i can't tell whether that's a um whether that's a, a, no, a that, thing about recording that, that's a comment about something else oh yeah that's cool <laughs> so i don't know if the, the late joiners if rosemary and max have any guesses all oh, right so yeah rosemary says ice flow glacier I thought it was a wind turbine or, or a water mill of some sort. Ah, okay, 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 cool. Who said gangplank? It was me. <laughs> You're right. Did you cheat? <laughs> well, yeah, well, not really. I was, I was literally searching for inspiration and there on the screen, it was gangplank. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Usually, I mean, it, it is because it's so, such a, I mean, you wouldn't often hear a game plank anyway. So, uh, but no, that was something that I found actually also towards the end of the trip, the first trip in Iceland. Um, I was exploring the harbour of, of Reykjavik and I just, from the distance, I could hear this, this sound and it was an irregular sound, but there was something rhythmical of it as well, as you heard. And then I just kept going and I don't even know if I should have been there or not. I just wandered into this area and there was this gangplank. So it was actually on the, the dock and as the boat moved, so it had these big um, nylon wheels that were turning. And so it's actually moving back and forth on the, the harbour side. But the way I recorded it was to jam an old vocal mic up underneath it. So you didn't hear the city and you can hear a little bit of water if you have the headphones. Um, or maybe you heard that anyway, I don't know. But, um, yeah. but you also hear this booming sound because the, the microphone's almost touching the metal of this gangplank. So as it's moving, it's kind of... <laughs> so it's just like a... Uh, it was like a kinetic work just sat there to be recorded, or just to be listened to, really. But the fact that I actually, you know, was just instead of, as I was doing before and as the other artists were doing, just following their sight lines and... and trying to find the interesting thing to capture with the video or with camera. It, this was definitely one of the things that I just remember the big shift in just trying to find that sound that I could hear from somewhere over there and just leading my way through. And then finding such an incredible sound. I wonder if, um, oh, so Rose, Rosemary, you got a question. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering how, I'm, I'm really sorry to have missed this earlier. Um, I went out shopping and didn't look at the phone. <laughs> um, oh, it's okay, it's, just, it's essential. Yeah, I mean, you probably have answered it already, but how do you use these, sound, these found sounds um, in music or um, sound art? Or? Well, with this, with this particular project, it was presented as it, as it is um, on, on the album that came out. Um, these really were, some are quite heavily processed sounds and then some are just deft as they were. I really wanted to give that mixture of, of how I treated these sounds. Um, and then later on I started to actually compose them more so they kind of flowed into each other or they were scenes within a, a larger kind of story, let's say. Um, these days I tend to use especially something like that. We'll come to it later, but I'll, I'll tend to use the, the, the energy that that recording has in it. So it will actually trigger something else. Another recording? Or a... Another recording or another sound or something else, which we'll see. <laughs> but, I, but I, yeah. I was going to say, I wonder if I could ask about um, the kind of the quality of the equipment that you were using. So you were clear that you started uh, off with, with something and then, you know, so, so where, did yeah. you, where did you see that you had to invest in, in how oh, your 
how your kind of career was progressing and, yeah, and well, what you were capturing. I guess. Okay. The, so the first trip I was traveling with an old mini disc recorder that I had to have to listen to music. Um, and then I took a, a vocal mic that I also have to have from my band days. Um, and then realized that I needed some other piece of equipment to actually make that sound louder because it was, it, it didn't have a, an amplifier inside it. So I had to buy an extra what's called a preamplifier to boost the signal. Um, so I was juggling this stuff as I was traveling with it, like handheld mic and all this kind of stuff, or actually having to put it down, which I've gone back to, I do that more now. Um, but there was one, particular sound that I thought I didn't I couldn't get close enough to it it was dripping water in uh, you've probably seen photos of it this iceberg lake uh, I'm gonna say it completely wrong but it's Jokulsavon in uh, the south of Iceland and it has these amazing blue icebergs floating in it but the water dripping from it as the sun was coming up I just really wanted to capture that sound and of course I got everything else as well as that sound and then filtering it just sounds unnatural to, to actually try and bring out that sound. So I decided after that trip or during that trip that I needed something much more directional. So, and it, it, when you start to get into this field recording activity, you are led to believe, I, I'm not wrong in saying that you should be buying more and more expensive equipment to get better quality mm. recordings. Uh, this is also something that I'll talk about later because I, I disagree. There are certain certain reasons for doing that. If you're doing it for, for cinema or there, there are, this is home and a place for everything. So if you do want pristine, you know, really sharp detailed recordings, then yes, some of this equipment makes sense. But the sort of stuff that most field recording or people that use field recordings in music or in art, it's not necessary. It's really not necessary. Just be a little more inventive. So, um, so I went down the path of very expensive equipment and now I probably have the cheapest equipment. No, no, I invested in some stuff. We won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, had to, I had to invest in higher quality stuff because I'm now documenting a lot more stuff with video in the studio. So it's, it's a different application. Mm. That's me justifying myself. <laughs> Two, can I ask something? Yeah. You said, um, yeah, you're using um, cheaper equipment now. Yeah. Um, to record the sound, presumably, capture it. Right. How does that work with when you, when you're, um, I don't know the word, um, you can't show it. Um, uh, performing it I don't know what's the word for sound when you show it to somebody else well I, okay so in in presenting sound books presenting okay. yeah presenting. Um, it depends on how that's going to be done if, if it's going to be through a very expensive speaker setup with like I don't know many speakers so the sound moves around you or whatever um, in recent years, I've, I've just grabbed something because I, I actually am kind of missing out. Oh, I'll that as well. Missing out quite a lot of this later as well. I, I use these, they're called transducers or tactile transducers. Uh, it's like a speaker, but without the cone. And actually uh, this one handily is magnetic to a piece of metal, but yeah. I just connect it as I would a normal speaker. And then this piece of metal then plays sound and it resonates with certain frequencies. It, res it doesn't place all the sounds and it, it completely changes some sounds. But in recent years, I've been working a lot with this and I can pretty much attach them to anything so I can make the space play. I can actually play a space much more. Right. So making a much, I can make a much more sort of site specific or site responsive work, let's say. Mm. And you have to, um, I don't know how much they cost, but are they expensive, those things? These, not so much. That was, uh, I'm going to say 20 euros, it could have been cheaper. All right. Okay. Yeah. 
so I travel with that and a little amplifier and I have my own yeah. sound system okay. in, in my suitcase. So. Okay, so I did mention that I've been to Colombia a couple of times um, and this is going to bring up some of the issues we were just talking about. Um, so between the long workshop with the master's students and then the project that I just spoke about, I was actually invited by a residency organization called Casa Tres Patios to have a gallery space in the local, I'm not going to say branch, but that's not right. <laughs> the, the local, it's the national university, anyway, the local campus of the national university, because they have one in almost every city in through Colombia. Um, no, it wasn't that. That was where I was doing that in Bogota. This is specific to this area, the University of Antioquia. Sorry, I'm getting all mixed up. Um, so I was given a gallery space for the best part of three months to do what I wish, to make work but, and to make experiments, to make developments of work. But the emphasis was on the process. It was not on the actual results. Um, which was fantastic. That's exactly what I've been looking for at that time because I'd been traveling heavily the year before and having to move from place to place. So as soon as I started to get my teeth into something, I'd really had to move on. And so just having some time to be able to process some of the things and some of the, some of the things I wanted to try, some of the things I'd seen and wanted to try another version of it or things I've read about. Sorry, I have a fly flying around here now. Um, so I will show you. It's a bit of a bad photo, but um, what they did was they actually put these curved walls in. I don't know if you can really see from this photo, but this was for um, two projections to be presented in the space before. Then they told me they were actually gonna clear the space out to, for me to be able to have it as an open space. But I really liked the sound of the space because everywhere you stood, it sounded different anyway, how you spoke and whatever you did in there. So I asked them to keep it, but just paint it black so I could then use it. You can just about see on the right, I could use it as a journal to write down everything was, that I was doing with pictures and notes and stuff. Uh, this is, uh, going back to what we were talking about, this kind of almost fetishized, fetishization, fetishized, fet fetishism of, um, field recording equipment and recording equipment in general or anything like cameras, anything you can think of that goes into this. Um, so I started to build these microphones specifically to burn them just to see how they sounded. It was, it was a bit of a statement at the time as well, but yeah, just really wanted to, to kind of go against this whole kind of uh, this idea that you have to have the, the best and most expensive equipment and you have to treat it so well as well. Uh, this is an experiment. So there's an artist called Alvin Lucia. He's uh, from the United States. And in 1969, I'll say, probably did it before, he made a work called I'm Sitting in a Room, where he spoke some text and recorded it. Then he played the recording back into the room and recorded it again on a different recorder. And as he repeated this process, the resonant frequencies of the room. So his voice disappeared and these tones actually come to the fore. Um, so it's an old experiment. I really wanted to try it in that space with the strange um, acoustics in there. But then I was allowed to use these uh, pre-Hispanic burial urns to make the work in a different way. So I actually did, I made this process inside these urns. Um, this actually became an album as well. Um, I called it from the mouths of clay. And so six different clay objects actually produce very different tones in this process. Uh, that's another part of the process. So I actually have a speaker to the, to the right, actually pointing at the clay object and then the microphones actually drop down inside. So it was the only way I could do it. I, there's actually an, a transducer on the back of it as well. So I tried it that way as well. But the acoustic sound worked much better. And that's one of the other ones with the recording equipment I was using at the time. 
And then this is what we saw the kids working with, but this is what I'll say my first kinetic work. So I was using the jumping speakers, but I was actually connecting them so that when the wire moved from one, while it was playing something, then it would trigger another sound over here and then another sound over here. And then the long wire, you can see that's close to the, the left-hand corner, going over to this metal dish. So the dish is actually being played by that long wire as the speaker moves. So actually producing, a, uh, uh, creating a little network of, of events that would happen. And this is the sound of the burning microphone. And this is a close-up of the, uh, the process that you saw. The dish is upturned if you didn't recognize it, but this is with that whole speaker network happening. Um, and the sounds you hear, some of them are, from, are produced from the, the, repeat, the repeating recording playback um, process. So it, it was just recording the sound, the ambient sound inside the pots and then playing it back and then recording it again, created these tones. I'm actually going to keep this screen up. Um, so, as I say, the, the, the emphasis was on the process, not the result. And that is actually um, uh, possibly something that I've followed a little too, <laughs> too much. So sometimes my work is more about the process than the result. But I, most of the time, I don't actually know how something's going to end up. I just put processes in place or if I start a situation and then see what happens. Um, thankfully, I think that usually, there usually does come a result or a, at least a, a satisfactory result at the end, but this is definitely how I approach things uh, more, well, since then. Um, from here, I was lucky enough to be invited again away. Um, so I was in Norway in Kristiansand at the very end of 2013. Um, I had a collection of motors with me from uh, old Walkmans and stuff. Um, that's another story. Um, and so I actually tried for the first time to play sounds through motors because I, I realized from the other, um, from the earlier uh, project that it's a, an electrical signal. I decided to take some of the recordings, like I was saying earlier about, about some of the sound energy, creating another sound or, or using that to make something else. So this is sounds that I recorded being played through motors 
which are then interacting with some objects that I found in the space and around the space. Um, everything's being picked up in uh, or through a uh, contact microphone with a little bit of reverb on it, um, which I don't use anymore at all. Um, but it's all inside a shopping trolley, which you'll see as I play it now. Yeah, I just really started to, to, to explore what was possible with sounds, not just playing them, or recording them and then playing them back through speakers to listen to again, or even to compose with them, but finding new ways of using them. Especially, again, you could hear possibly that this is, this is a, an environmental sound. I think it was wind through a cable. And so it's, it's very unpredictable, it's very random. And so to use these recordings, they're, 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 it happens all the time, but then it stops. And I don't know when, especially when I'm playing back something and I'm not looking at the waveform or something, I don't know when that action is going to happen again. I really like that, that the, the work's even surprising me, even though I set it up. It's like it takes on a life of its own. Um, so I'm going to move on from there. I'm actually going to skip a stage because I am talking way too much. And I'm gonna come to um, getting involved in land art, which I, or nature art, which I didn't even know existed until I was involved in these projects. So um, again, it involves a bit of travel. Uh, I was actually in Korea at the time and then I got invited to, to Japan the first time here for this project in 2014. Uh, as you can see, I've been lucky enough to be invited three times. Uh, the first time I was invited, I met all these people working with uh, the environment, uh, making nature art, so making very ephemeral works with things they found in the forest, or um, some made slightly more permanent works, but then the whole idea was that we had to put the, the park back the way we found it. But they invited me and then said, can you make a sound piece? And I said, well, do you have some speakers? And they said, no. And so I said, well, I don't really know how I can make a sound piece that I can't play on anything. So what I did in the end was actually performed, but I did make a sound piece to be played in the gallery space that they had. So I'm just gonna play a little piece of that, so.
Um, I'll just say that that last sound, the quite loud sound that just came whoosh. Um, so in this park where we were making the project, there was this huge long slide that went all the way down through the park. That was supposed to be for kids, but of course we all had to have a go. And instead of actually a, like a solid metal slide, it had these rollers all the way down it. So that's, that recording is actually taken from underneath the slide as someone's sliding down. So you hear them go over and then as it fades, it's actually just the, the rollers actually gradually slowing down to stop. Um, I'd almost forgotten that was in there. So then I'm going to show you the next year I was invited back. I really wanted to make something more, more tangible, more like that made sound in the space, but without speakers, it was a challenge. So, um, uh, the, 2014 version or the, the edition that I went to there was a guy that made a huge kind of cello uh, my friend Mutsuharu Takahashi I have to check his name and um, I mean he's been inspiration to me ever since as well um, I will keep mentioning people that have been inspiration um, and so he made this this kind of land art cello and whilst we were talking about it, it would be great if we could play it, wouldn't it? We can actually make these, these strings sound. And so this was kind of my, my version of that. Um, I took some old, and hopefully you can all see this, but I took some old drawers that the organization actually kindly co collected for me. And I attached them to a, an avenue of trees. And then above each one, I hung piece of broken glass because I wanted to use things that I'd found that I found in the space and these the piece of glass seemed to work very well as a, as a plectrum on a piece of wire that I'd stretched over each um, each drawer so the drawers are upturned and so the the thin back is up or facing upwards and then there's a wire stretched across it with a bridge like a guitar or a stringed instrument to get the resonance or to accentuate the resonance of the string um, and so I think there were 14, 13 of these all the way along this avenue of trees. Okay, there are only three photos. So then we go to the next one, which is a short video of the piece, but close up from above. So you can actually see the, the glass being blown by the wind hitting the string. So you get the idea. There are a whole bunch of them, like you see there. All facing in different directions, so they were catching the wind in different directions. The, diff the heights made a difference. Um, the, the strength of the wind really made a difference. If it was very windy, it didn't actually work because they would either miss or it just wouldn't, um, just didn't seem to, to have any effect and then just the lightest wind, and then they all seem to start playing in different ways. Uh, I'm gonna go straight into the next slide. So 
as I said, lucky enough to be invited three years in a row. By the third year, I really was stuck on what I was going to do. Um, so I had a salvaged speaker, as you can see there. I tried this idea with ink because like ink and paper is very traditional from, from that part of, the, of Asia, Japan, China, Korea. Um, but I just wasn't really happy with the effect. And I did also wonder about leaving ink splatters all over the countryside. So um, I decided to make something more ephemeral or like temporary. So I started to make these landforms you can just about see in the center of the photo there. Uh, I had my own hydrophone I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the underwater microphone. And this is all the way along a mountain stream that flows through the park. Um, so I had a, a battery power powered amplifier so I could power the speaker. And then what I did was I took the sound of the water from underwater, especially where it was falling in the cascade, like you see behind there, and it would actually make the speaker jump. And so I would fill it uh, alternately with, with soil and with water to make these kind of, uh, well, they became volcano, volcano shapes. So here's a, hopefully a short clip of the process, and then you'll see some of the, there's more of a slideshow of the results. So yeah, that was that was a very quick explanation as to how I got into some of these the, some of the land art things. I took the idea of the the um, the energy of the sound uh, once again from motors and then from creating these landforms. I I'm thinking about the whole thing of it creating an electrical current. Surely it would produce light as well. So I was again in lucky enough to be invited to a project where I could do whatever I wanted. And I said, well, I, I want to try this idea. Uh, can we find an empty space or use some, some um, found objects, but I really want to make a light and sound installation. And so this was uh, South Korea, uh, this was 2016. Um, just super lucky to be invited to this thing, um, to be given the freedom, to be given the, the resources. Um, in this tiny little town called Namwon, it's a very historic town, um, but it's half empty. Like all the, the young people go to the big cities and, and or, or overseas. So yeah, it's, it's, so there's a lot of empty spaces. There's a lot of scope for exploring abandoned places and, and finding abandoned things on the street as well. So, like I said, it's a very traditional, very historic city. So this is the, the inside of the, the palace within the center of the city. But then this is a typical kind of street or, or almost like a courtyard from, away from the street where this, this, I don't know how long it's been empty, but it's clearly been empty for quite some time. Uh, this is actually the back of the space. I was allowed to use the first floor to, to present my work. Um, so they managed to get permission. I mean, could have used it anyway, maybe, but we needed to get electricity in there. Um, and so I used 
don't know if you can see this so well, but this is a plastic bucket hanging by a door. And that actually says knock in Korean. So you're supposed to knock before you go in. But I wanted that kind of, that to be emphasized. And then these styrofoam boxes are almost everywhere in the street. They're, they're, they're used to, to in, mostly in markets. There's lots of outdoor markets there. Um, but they're great for using these transducers because they play low frequencies really nicely. They really do resonate. Um, but also, as you can see, they light up really well as well. So I just found some, some light bulbs from um, flashlights that would take, what, uh, nine volts, I think? The big, I can't remember. Um, but I had to really be careful because if I went over, if I played too loud, the bulbs would just blow. So it was actually composing a work with, with light and with sound, not just because of the lighting effect, but also then when I put the objects in the space. You can see that I suspended them so they would actually resonate more and they would light up different areas of the room in a different way or in a more interesting way than if they were just put on the floor. Um, so I think there might be a video coming up of that. Uh, I took it from um, Korea. I was uh, fortunate enough to be invited to give a solo show in Tokyo the follow earlier the following year. So I took the work there as well. So I'll show you a video that's a combination of the two.
uh, a development of that was to take it uh, again in Japan. Yes, I was in Asia a lot those couple of years. Um, I took it to uh, something called the Nakanojo Biennale. Uh, I think it was the third or fourth edition of that. And I made a piece with everyday sounds of traffic in a street. So this is the town itself. It's three hours from Tokyo. I don't know if it should take three hours, but it does by train. Um, this is the space I was given. It's a, an empty shop space on the, what was a thriving street once upon a time. So the same project problem as in Korea, all the young people are leaving for the bigger cities and bigger towns. Maybe it's the same everywhere. Um, and then I was able to find these uh, scrap car parts. So there's a bonnet, there's two doors and there's a, a boot there as well. And I wanted to use those to play the sounds back and then use lamps that I found in, in the uh, parts of the car as well to actually light up the space and light up the object. And so I arranged them in this way, you can see it's quite a small space, but then I managed to completely black it out and create this kind of effect. So the sound itself again is, is creating the light, but in, um, in a kind of multi-channel way. So it's moving around the space. You can see that I actually used the, the light of the boot to, to light up the space as well when a sound is playing through it. is probably better to watch in a darkened room with some decent headphones or something because it became more like an abstract film. I had to, to, um, to video things up so close because the well, trying to film in a darkened space, you see the results. So, uh, okay, so uh, then taking a slight step back to using the speakers as kind of a, a tool to make something to paint. Um, I made a performance with a Korean drummer, this is in 2017. Um, so I actually have the microphone set up right in front of him. And when he really strikes the drum, then it causes the speakers to jump. And then we're making a, a, a sound painting or a painting with the ink, with the sound. And this is traditional Korean ink and traditional paper. So it actually soaks out in a really nice way as well. As you can see. And then this piece was exhibited in an exhibition that followed. So this was the opening event for an exhibition. And then I was invited to the Jonam, where is it? the Jonam International Ink Art Biennale in a small town called Mok, well, no, quite a large town called Mokpo in the south of South Korea because of the work that I've been doing with the drummer and with some of the other um, drawing and making projects with speakers. And so again, I was given an abandoned space. It's an old uh, coffee shop, Dabai. You can even see the toilet back there. And I had a collection of different speakers. The larger ones are taken directly from a car that was cut up in a performance I was involved in before. Uh, the smaller ones, I can't remember where they were from, but I, I would take speakers from everywhere to use in these projects. And the, the more different, the better, the, the, the greater variety, the better. 
Uh, so this is some of the results. So I took sounds, underwater sounds from the harbour nearby. So it used to be a thriving city and now it's not. It's actually very, very much abandoned also. Um, and so I took these uh, underwater recordings of things clunking, like boats clunking together and stuff like that. But they're all just sat there in the harbour. They're not going anywhere. They're not doing anything. And then these clunks became what made the, the speaker spill out the ink. And then I presented it. I had eight of these large paintings. And in the space, there were lights that were almost hanging down from the ceiling on these coil wires. So I actually pulled them down. So they were actually lighting up the, the drawings from behind. And then I suspended them around these light bulbs. So you could actually see right the way through. It gives more like a three dimensional effect almost. So you can see the space a little more then. And there's some smaller um, experiments going on on the floor with tubes of paper around a speaker. And then when the speaker spits out, then it creates these, these lines going down. So we've got, we've got a couple of questions from, um, from Ian in the chat. Ian says, um, first of all, when, uh, regarding the drawers that were in the Japanese park, was it important how the strings were tuned that uh, the, the glass was playing over? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say no. I, I, I came from being a guitarist, but... I, okay, so there, there, is, there are many of these works that I see. There's, there's a classic one where some, a ball is rolling down through an amazing forest scape but it plays a tune. And so you're not listening to the sound of the device, you're not listening to the echo in the space, you're listening to the music it's making. And it, it, it happens with so many, I mean, I, I shouldn't speak badly about it, but I just feel like, why does everything need to become a piece of classic, like a piece of classical music from hundreds of years ago as well? It's, it's not even contemporary. So it just, everything has to, and that's, I get this all the time. So you take these recordings and you make them into music. Well, actually, no, I don't. I, I, I moved, I actually made a conscious decision to move away from that. And, and like really consciously moving away from anything that was, that was musical. You'll hear fragments of music in my work now, but most of the time, and that I guess is quite musical, that piece, but it, I didn't want it to play, yeah, I didn't want it to play a certain scale or anything, it was just, and it, believe me, if I tried within an hour, it was out of tune anyway, so it wouldn't have worked. But no, I, I just wanted it to, to be as random as it, as it was. <laughs> but I then, mean, most, hmm? then you, you do choose things though, don't you? So when you make recordings, presumably you choose good ones and throw away bad ones. Mm. So you, are, you are selecting for the sounds in a way. Yeah, but I would say the ones I choose these days are probably what people class as bad ones. <laughs> I throw away the good yeah, ones. Yeah, but you're, you're still, you're, you're still I am controlling still, it. Aren't I you? am with, with recorded work for sure. Yeah, this is why we're going to come on to the, the next stage where I'm less, less, much less in control of what happens. Um, but yeah, yeah, this is, this is, this is something that I, that I had, many thoughts about with, with using field recordings in composition that, that you, you take these um, very unpredictable things. I mean, you know, the, we, uh, Stuart and I were talking yesterday about, or, yeah, well, two days ago, about the, 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 if you want to record a sound, if you want to record a specific sound and you, you hear it and you go and get your recorder ready, nine times out of 10, that sound will stop. <laughs> it's the you know the, the frustration the the sod's law of, of field recording or then when you listen to it again it's nothing like you thought it sounded because you're, it's not in the space and it's not you hearing it again so um but this idea of taking these 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 quite random sounds and then composing them and putting them in your you know bending them to your whim i do actually go against that so with with a lot more of my my more recent um works it's actually what there's quite, a, there's, there's not so much of the kind of the, the archetypal field recording stuff in there anymore. Um, it, it is more that it might seem random or things that things kind of fall into place and I don't really know how that happened, but I, I leave that in there. So I am working against that. 
<laughs> there was um, actually Ian had another question on um, looking at the light. So saying about um, because well, and I guess because you were generating light from the sound. How about yep. working it the other way around by recreating the sound from the light using a photo cell? I. I was thinking about your pop recordings, really, where you record it over and over again. Mm, right. So you could you could sort of change it into light and then back into sound again in the same loop. I I could. I hadn't even thought of it. That's I'll be honest with you. So um, I I guess I know some artists that already do work with photo cells and photo uh, photo sensors. So for me, it was it was. It was like it was just an experiment really to see if it would work to start with and then when it did it's like okay now i, I have something else. it is it changed the way i composed for those two pieces it, it really did make it okay i know i'm not just composing with the sound now and not with four channels and whatever but then i am really composing with the light it's it it, it was quite strange quite a strange process and i really i had you know it, that was three years ago and i haven't had the opportunity to do it again since so I don't see how that relates to what you, you said a couple of minutes ago when you said it, it changed what you did, mm. the fact you were using light. But then a couple of minutes ago, you were saying, well, really, you didn't have much control over things. You just took it as, it, as you found it. So, so how did the... Oh, I, the yeah, I, so three years ago, I guess I was uh, more in control. And then as I'll go on to explain with the next couple of projects, I'm less in control. Ace, any more questions about this bit? Or should we, um, should we oh, um, Rosemary's asking if there's a Zen influence in your work. An unconscious one, I think. I don't consciously think of my okay. work as a, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it, it, it's probably something that, that other people would come to me and say, but it's not, I'm not considering it at the time. Is it because of it being sometimes mostly in Asia, that stuff that I just No, did? no, no, no. I, I saw, um, I'm just sorry, I, I heard a program on Radio 3 about John Cage and Zen, and mm. um, he, you know, he uses, you probably know, I mean, pieces where there's nothing happens and it's all about the surround, sound that's around you, but I mean, his yeah. work would be different in that he's not intervening in any way, whereas you're more creating instruments out of Right, After but what but, is around you? Would you see it like that? It's, but like Ian said, it, it, it's it's he it, he in a way he did intervene because he just he still framed it. Yes, yes. he still yes. chose when and where to do it. Yes. Um, it wasn't completely out of control. I I, no. I mean I, I don't want things to be completely out of control. Yes, most of the time, but when they are, sometimes it creates some amazing things. But yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess I'm working against being control free. So. Maybe okay. steps, okay. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's not. It's not something that I that I consider in my work. Um, it's funny because I I always kind of I reacted quite strongly because everyone would would say that John Cage was the godfather of everything and da da da. And then I just I look at my my works like that and think, okay, I'm I'm doing something very similar. You know, I'm I am searching for this this hands-off approach to mm -hmm. composition or but yeah you still have to frame you still have to do you still have to be there i guess as as, as a composer or as a, an artist to, to well, you're, you're kind of something. yeah exactly you're, you're kind of creating situations or, or, right, or, right. or um, it, sort of instruments right. out of unusual things and objects but mm -hmm. but in standing back from actually um selecting that sound or composing with it i see a sort of zen like acceptance of whatever yeah. happens however the water falls or mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You see what I mean? yeah yeah there's a there's a good quote from john cage which i won't get right but uh, <laughs> someone asked him about losing control and random processes and he said basically what well, was random and random so implying that he he liked to to pick and choose from his random right yeah, I was just reading something about him recently that said he actually didn't, he couldn't stand most of the performances of his work. He would walk out of things. So, yeah, you set, your, you set the scene and then, <laughs> oh, I don't really like that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> 
I was just thinking how, you know, arguably if you work with it, with any kind of, within any kind of musical system or you work with any particular instrument, um, then you, you're, yeah, you're choosing to use that instrument, but you don't choose the rules of that instrument. You don't choose how many keys there are on a piano. They don't, you don't choose, um, you know, how many frequencies your recording device can capture. You don't choose, you know, whatever, how many holes there are on a flute. Um, so I suppose there's, a, there's an interesting question there about how much you, how much you ever have any kind of control over what you, what you make and how much is predetermined by, you know, the parameters that are set for you through the materials that you're using. Um, do you think that with your work, you know, arguably, <laughs> to use the piano analogy, it's just got more keys? <laughs> uh, I don't quite understand. So, like, from from what I mean is the parameters. <laughs> the para in general, the pr uh -huh. your work in general, the parameters of what you choose to work with are are wide, much wider than. Uh, certain sort of like traditional instrumentation. Okay. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in terms of the, the amount of um, control that you have over that, that environment, um, it's, you, you still, you're still interacting with instrumentation. It's just the instrumentation that you're interacting with uh, is kind of a wider scope. Yeah, yeah, but, but the piano, is played in many different ways, of course, but I'm not sitting at an instrument playing it. It's, it's actually putting something in place that would, would allow something else to happen. Yeah. Like, for example, having something falling on piano keys that ran or like that kind of thing that that would Yeah, maybe I'm not explaining myself properly. <laughs> I suppose what okay I'll try a different angle what I'm, what yeah. I'm trying what I'm trying to get to is the idea that um, if you choose to play a note on a on an instrument <laughs> um, you're making a choice to hit let's say a middle C on the yeah. piano yeah. however what you don't have control over is the speed very specific microtonality of that string that's being hit. What you don't have control over is the very specific uh, uh, form and function of the hammer that's hitting that string. Okay. You don't have uh, any control over what the very specific resonant uh, resonance of the, the piano resonant chamber is because you know you didn't build it. Okay. You, you okay. See what I'm saying? Yeah, but but you but you are relying on. The, that system that's been put in front of you. Mm. I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, an instrument that's been developed over many years to, to do exactly what you said, that it does that thing when you press that key. Mm -hmm. No matter how much there is a variance in, like very small variance in any of those things, it's still gonna sound like a middle C. Sure, but I'm trying to situate it on a continuum <laughs> <laughs> at the other end of which, is something more akin to what I, what I think is more akin to your work, where you're, you, you are still making a decision. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So I'm just following on from what yeah. Ian was saying, really. Yeah, yeah. In a roundabout kind of way. Well, I, I mean, you have to. If you, if you are going to investigate any of this, you have to... I mean, yeah, with, with certain parameters and everything, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Stuart, I've killed it. <laughs> no, no, I don't, I don't mean so. I think, I, I guess that's why I asked the question about how you choose, tune the strings, because you, there's an example where you're making yourself an instrument, really, following on from what Max was saying. So you're not just taking the environment sound, you're, you're making right, your own right. sound environment. Right. But you're, 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 you're sort of happy to make your own sound environment up to a point, but then 
<laughs> not beyond that point. I think that's precisely right. Yes. Yeah. Because mm. it, 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 yeah. I, I had very little control over when the things would actually play and um, and actually, like, it was, like we said, in the tuning, I mean, the tuning would change. So it was, it was, it was still putting, putting something that I built into place to then see what happened mm. to, to be, and to be interested in, to be interested in that process of how it changes. So, so are, you in, are you interested in the experience of your observers, your audience? Absolutely. So, okay, so the, the, as you say, the tuning changes and so their experience changes, but that doesn't really matter. Is, is, that, is that true? Well, anyone coming into it at any different time, it would be different anyway. Okay. Mm. But you, are, you, you, mm. are, you, are, you are creating it for the audience, are you? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, that's I mean, a big you question. Be, you <laughs> thing about, the thing about choice, the thing about choices, if you, make it, if you do anything creative, you absolutely have to make a choice, don't you? I mean, that's the whole point of being creative, is to make a choice. Okay, yeah, yeah. You, even if you just say, I'm going to record the rain as it's happening now. You've made that choice to record it. Yes. Yeah. It's all it's all about choices. Absolutely. You can't really get away from it, can you? I mean No, but but it's it's, it's it like yeah, but it it's it's taking a step back. Yes, I know. It's not a total control of. It's allowing it to happen. Yeah. 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 But that happens anyway. Um if you yeah. do it, you go into an art gallery and you look at anything like say a, you know a painting how i see it won't be the same as how you see it absolutely absolutely it's totally different you know and somebody way back you know if it's uh you know say michelangelo i mean in that when he was um creating his stuff the people who looked at it won't look at it the same as how we look at it today so every right. It's all it all changes and but anyway, I just think to me choices um well that that's the, that's what you get when you mm. do something as, as an artist, you make choices, and if you don't make a choice, you can't really do anything <laughs> you don't to get out of bed in the morning, you just be there. That's us artists, isn't it? We don't get out of bed. <laughs> we stay in bed all day. We don't do anything. We used to stay there. So, so Rose, Rosemary has a couple of questions as well while we're here. Yeah, well, yes, I, I, I see, you know, the, 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 the essential, the value of your art as being, um, it, as being a revelation rather than manipulating the sounds into the music. And I was really moved by listening to the burning microphone. I thought that was amazingly powerful. Um, because of a sound that's finite, that's, mm. that's destroying itself. I thought that was amazing. I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I don't know. If I was writing about your work, I would sort of find something to say about, um, perhaps it's sort of showing a kind of hopeful relation between the technology and the environment, sort of opening up new ways of how the modern world and its amazing discoveries could help us to understand things around us in more deeply. I don't know what you think about that. Um, I think I think I was actually going for that kind of idea in the uh, in the early days. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, hopefully, hopefully. I, I, I was thinking with the, the more um, recent projects with um, with devices, which I'll, I'll explain in the next section, but. But it's still about, I've taken devices that people, you know, and jumping the gun a bit here, I've taken things that people threw in the, threw out in the street that when I took them apart, they seem to still work. So why do people just throw them away? Why, why do we have to get the, the newest, latest thing and, and fill the streets and landfill with this stuff that can easily be 
repurposed even if it's if it can't be repaired that's great thanks very much it's it's a it's a step on from what you were saying but it's mm -hmm. it's still considering mm -hmm. just getting people to think about something a little more <laughs> as i was just saying this project in 2000 late 2018 it was a, a, a circuitry built toy that um from maplins no they don't exist anymore and it actually had two motors that one would it would like like um, random motion and i wanted to use some of that in um, in a sound piece in a performance and then as i started to work with it i realized it's only one motor that was actually running in a random fashion and the other one was running all the time so i took away the motor that was running all the time and started to use the random one um finding that it's not actually random because when you start it, it goes through the same sequence. I've used it a few times to know that this, that it's not completely random. Um, I took this opportunity with this project that you're going to see now to learn some Arduino programming to actually learn how to program in a more random way. There are still parameters, of course, but I wanted to, to get away from this thing where it's actually not really random because i know i may as well just use a field recording as i've done before excuse me so i found uh, and there was a delay in getting the production budget for this project so i started scouring the streets for uh, devices and so that hi-fi system you just saw gave me these uh, motor devices so there's a cd player there there's a cassette player there's a, a fan uh, I don't know what the other motor is. Um, and then from there learned about stepper motors, which I didn't even know existed before this. Uh, it was a very steep learning curve in motors, um, electronics, uh, programming, and it ended up, and it was actually, this was definitely another one that, that is, it's a result of the process. I hadn't designed it before. Um, but it became a collection of devices like this, all presented in a box, in a, a display case that I made for each one. Um, so that, that was the prototype one. Why did it go right back to the beginning? And then that's the final collection of these devices. Um, I actually presented them in a way that you could walk backwards and forwards through them. And you'll see now, Uh, this is a very quick movie that the, the organization actually made for the work. One of the one of the things I realised I would had started recording uh, when I was exploring a new place was um, I wasn't going so much for nature sounds or for kind of ambient sounds or anything um, ambient as in easy listening cuts. Um, I was interested in hearing machines or devices that were actually kind of not quite working correctly, going wrong like like fans, like ventilation fans or something, but they were kind of knocking on their casings or just you, you, you can hear them in the street all the time um but i became more interested in actually then uh actually finding a way to make these machines do this myself to actually make these machines that, that don't work properly um and so this project came from that where I did want to use motors that I found in the street, uh, devices. So there are belts from printers and scanners. Um, I've added extra sort of, uh, like stylus, styli, um, to kind of prepare it in some way. Um, 
there's there's a lot of machine sound as you can hear, but there are it, it it's I wanted it to 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 create more acoustic sound. I wanted to get away from using the speakers and actually have the devices kind of accentuate their sound. So the, the box acts as a kind of resonator as well, um, albeit in quite a soft way because I used aluminium. Um, and this was actually my, what, it's my first non-site specific work. It was one that I could take anywhere. I can plug it in anywhere. As long as I have three tables and a dark space, this can be shown anywhere really. Uh, whereas everything else has been really about responding to a, a place or a situation. Um, and so I've, I've just continued with that really. Um, actually really moving away from, from field recording. Um, uh, but <laughs> then I went back to field recording for this project. Well, there was two projects last year that I was invited to, uh, both of them involving uh, bodies of water. And so I went back to field recording, but then I started to do this um, record playback, but actually through objects, through materials. So I took the sound of water that I recorded through metal, mostly, and then I played it back through the transducer or through something like that, and recorded it again through the metal. You can see this is a, a lock gate in Norway. This is in the Telemark region of Norway. Um, the thing you can see with the cable wrapped around the handrail is actually a hydrophone that I can use as a, as a contact mic to pick up um, lower frequencies, deeper sounds. And then this is me recording the sound that I probably recorded through that handrail and many other sounds that I recorded through metal. But on top is the hydrophone with water so it makes a better connection. And then on the front of the box is one of the transducers. And then I have to the right, I actually have a directional mic pointing at the other face of the metal box. So I'm getting an ambient sound of the metal vibrating as well. This repetition process does change the sound and become, so the, the, the material itself starts to really ring. Um, so you're actually hearing the tone produced by the sound. And the second project was in the Black Forest in Germany. And there's this crazy big reservoir and dam. Uh, the dam itself is unique in that it's, they, used, they, they designed it to use the least amount of concrete. So all of, you can see these circular or semicircular sections along the top. They're actually, they're these channels, they're, that's actually empty. There's a little hollow in behind there. You can kind of see it there as well. So the actual performance, uh, the festival that I was part of actually happened down there underneath the dam because they had, uh, when the, the night fell, they actually had projections all across it as well. Uh, that's when we were recording the debris in the bottom right hand corner hitting the side. Uh, that part is actually fiberglass, that part of the, the dam. I don't know why it's a different material there, but it's kind of plasticky sound. And then I'm repeating the process as in Norway playing the sound through the metal. This is expansion panels in the, in the dam. And then again, recording it with the hydrophone. And that was the sound of the piece that I've composed from the two projects. And I'll play that now. So you'll actually, you'll actually hear some of that. It, it, there's, no, um, there's no software processing as such. It's actually the recording process repeated has actually changed a lot of these sounds.
From there to the end of last year, uh, I was invited to go and do another project in Korea. And so I was in an old repurposed cassette making factory. Um, again, took machines and motors that I found, but also uh, I was given a couple of um, video recorders to take apart. Uh, if this actually is a video. No, it's just photos. Um, so the, the, what the devices in your boxes, in the boxes you saw, that was very non-site specific or the, uh, I could take it anywhere. This one, I actually wanted to take the, the ideas that I had for the devices, actually making their own sound and amplifying that acoustically um, or actually um, using parts to, um, to amplify them. So body, the bodies of the VCRs, I again stretched a wire across so that a spinning motor would actually almost play that as well, just to make it make the, the, the sound a lot more, a lot more loud acoustically. And that's the, um, the space that I decided to use to install. So I just used all of the girders and the lighting rails and the, um, the air conditioning units. So the, the work was actually up in the ceiling because a lot of these works with devices I'm, I'm seeing a lot now and they're actually placed on the floor in collections or mostly on the floor. And I was exhibiting alongside another artist. He was in the, the, um, the gallery space right next to me and he had stuff stood on the floor and stuff on the walls, like very um, traditional way of showing work. So I just wanted something where it took your attention to the ceiling where no one usually looks. Um, as I was installing, people came in and said, did you put that in? They hadn't even noticed it before. So it's a way of actually taking your attention up to somewhere where you wouldn't normally look or certainly don't take any notice of. Uh, there's a very short video here. It's very dark. So if you can't see anything again, watch it later if you can. Um, but it should show a little bit of what's happening. You'll definitely, you'll definitely hear what's going on. And then this leads me to what I've been working on since lockdown. Uh, taking another device that I found in the street, which is a hi-fi system. Um, the double cassette mechanism, as you can see, but this is the reverse of it. So one motor controls both, but with the, uh, the belts and the gears, then that's how you play and record two cassettes. Um, but I was really interested in, with a lot of the device, um, device projects that you've heard, they're very much, they're very, well, mostly percussive sounds, like they're knocking and grinding and everything, uh, not grinding, um, 
there's like kind of ratchet sounds and things like that. So I really wanted to make something that was actually a little more tonal. Um, so I, you can probably see, you'll see from the video later, that um, I've actually prepared it by putting parts of guitar strings, like the, the thicker wire guitar strings, and I've actually attached them from screws that were already there. So I don't have any tools here really. Um, and then I've bent them into place so they can kind of play these discs that are turning and the belts and stuff as well. Um, so that's another view of it. I actually found an old uh, suitcase that housed it quite nicely as well. And that's a CD Walkman motor right in front of us there as well, of the two motor devices. Uh, to the right, you'll see a mixer, a preamplifier, and a computer power supply, which a computer power supply is great for powering any kind of project like this because you have 12 volt supplies, five volt supplies, and three volt supplies, and you have a whole bunch of them. So they're really great. Just a little tip for everyone. Um, so again, we're using Arduino programming to get some, some constant motion sometimes, and then some more unpredictable um, action. Uh, is this the video? It may be. I'll just show a short, uh, I hope it's a short video, and then, um, and then we'll talk again. So this is something that, um, that I've been working on to, to record with, um, to, to just have a play around with really, I guess, to have a project to do while I'm here. Um, but I actually wanted to make, I wanted to take all the, the, the stuff that I've been doing with the Arduino was that, um, um, for those who don't know about that, we'll explain that later, but um, to make something like an instrument that I can take out and perform with. Um, which hasn't happened yet, of course, because the opportunity is not there yet. Mm, yeah. Not even here, because we're, we're kind of, I think we're back in lockdown here again, or we're, we're definitely into wearing masks into, in, um, in closed spaces. But events seem to be happening again. Cool.
So have we, have we got any, has anybody got any further kind of questions or, or things about the last section that we've just seen? Ian? Yeah, well, sort of following on from the previous discussion where I think you were saying that in your more recent work, you, you've taken sort of less editorial decisions and less control. Mm -hmm. But it, I mean, it seems to me that the later stuff you just showed us the sound worlds are pretty much created by you. So in a way you've, you've I mean, where you started with your recording of the, uh, in Iceland. Yeah. There, there you're taking a sound that was just there. Right. And what you just showed us is, which I quite like what you just showed us, mm. but you're engineering these things to sound how they do. And although they're controlled randomly, but, but still the, the sort of overall sound pattern is set by you. So you're, you're much more like a composer now than, than you were when you started. Mm. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, no, no. Well, it, I mean, it's it's interesting that I I I don't think of it that way because I feel like when I was like not taking the raw recordings, but but um, a lot of the the work that I was doing, let's say up until two thousand and ten, eleven, was was much more composed. I was actually taking sounds and I was actually changing them and processing them and putting them in some kind of like narrative order maybe um for me I, I feel like yes i'm setting something up but then with some of those uh processes like with this this uh, the, i'm pointing because the the uh, cassette mechanism is right next to me because of the nature of the the um we'll, we'll call them style i or you know the, the the little arms that are playing they sound different every time it is still quite unpredictable. Yes, I've built it and I've set it up, but I can never get the same sound again out of it, which is kind of annoying. That's why I have to record everything. Because <laughs> I am a control, I am a control freak. I really am, and that's, I'm working against that. So, yeah, I guess the, the way the way I'm thinking of it is that I was taking things and I was sort of composing them. That's my idea of, of controlling them. But but yeah, I, I hadn't I hadn't really thought of it that way. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I to ask you, um, in your in your um, piece of meter malfunction? Yeah. You had the um, the machine things inside boxes. Did you make those boxes? I actually made the boxes. Yes. Oh, yeah. What, what did you make them of? <laughs> <laughs> they were they were aluminium and. Um, uh, perspex like plexiglass um yeah i mean it, it, what started as a as a um i'll tell you now that they had quite a, 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 a generous production budget for the project and when i started taking things from the street and ripping out all the devices and things the guys around me were just like oh you you just get to keep all the production budget you know you're going to be rolling in money after this when I decided to present them, like, because they're, they're all junk, they're all pieces of things that have been thrown away, and I'm representing them in these kind of display cases that are protective and they're like little strong boxes. Um, that, yeah, I blew the budget on that. <laughs> but now I, and I, I've only recently, I used to do design, I, was, I trained as a designer, but I never really learned computer aided design, and so everyone was saying, I just had the pieces cut to shape and size, I'd rather. And then I was drilling all the holes and marking it out. And everyone kept coming in and saying, because they're like 20 years younger than me. And they're saying, why don't you just draw it on computer and have it laser cut? I'm like, uh. <laughs> so it was, it was a labor of love. <laughs> they remind me of um, like sub, submarines or. Uh, that goes under the water, something like that. Yeah, I think because of the darkness and the way they light up, yeah. But uh, I don't know if anyone remembers Blake 7, <laughs> but there was a thing called, I think it was called Aurac, and it was a, a box that was part of the, the uh, computer. That, there was the big computer in the in the the, um, the ship, and then there was this little one that was also yeah. a smart ass. And I just, uh, as I was making it, I was like, I've made Aurac. I've, I've gone back to my childhood sci-fi dreams. And <laughs> <laughs> 
can I ask what the um, was there any relationship between those boxes between the you know was there in the same way that we'd seen the similar wires no, no they, they were they were they're all powered by again by computer um, power supplies but each one has one or two Arduinos in it um, and they are controlling the, the motors I've actually since discovered that I could have used less but because I wanted to, them to be each one to be as 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 independent as possible mm. then no but actually when you when you sit in it and 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 it's surrounding you it seems like it, it, it's not really patterns but it, it doesn't seem as random as it actually is and it, it, it is like if you just have one box I, I, I switch the thing on and plug one or two in and I think it's not working and then suddenly that'll work at the same time and then yeah so yeah it's, it's strange that we, we maybe we're making our own patterns in it you haven't made them sentient have you I mean you know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I have <laughs> unintentionally but maybe yeah. they do seem to have a life of their own they definitely have characters yeah they definitely have characters i didn't mean to be as cute as they are as well but they kind of are <laughs> <laughs> if you like that kind of thing <laughs> so i wonder if there's a, a link to what you were saying quite early on about there being patterns in water or rhythms in water. There's de well, there's definitely there are definitely rhythms in water. I saw someone wrote that if you repeat a loop of water running, that that people can hear it. But I I'm I'm not so sure about that. Mm. Just really, it'd have to be quite a short loop, I think. But definitely, having having used water to to create those some of those works, you know, so so watching the the, the speaker move, definitely there's there's a lot of, a lot of. Um, it's it's even some of the sounds that you think are going to make it pop up and down don't so that really shows how how irregular it is um can i ask what what sort of format do you normally release uh recorded music in is it well it's all changing now yeah. so <laughs> um uh i have had a couple of cassettes out recently and another one is coming out probably by the end of the year a cd should be out soon i know there are two cds so yeah that, i mean i took a break from releasing stuff because i felt like there was way too much of my stuff out there um and some of it had got quite samey so I, I didn't want to unless i had something new to to say or present i wanted to to wait um and then suddenly yeah there's like three things in the pipeline now coming out soon so I suppose two, two CDs, which is unusual. As a follow on question from that is that is the kind of physical medium or media that the, that the, that the sound is playing from part of your overall uh, process, you know, because, you know, for example, when you were playing things through, uh, you know, using a material materials yeah. for yeah. amplification, um, you know, if I play it on my, on my stereo here, or if I listen to it on these terrible iPhone headphones or, or whatever, then obviously it's going to sound quite different. And if it's on, yeah, yeah. on, on vinyl, it's going to sound different to tape and so on. Absolutely. So absolutely. And yeah. Is that a consideration of yours? It's absolutely a consideration. Yeah. Yeah. I actually was asked a couple of years ago to release something on cassette. And so I made a piece to be listened to on cassette. I just... Even, I mean, there are, there are kind of errors and there are things in it that even if the tape gets chewed up, it should, it might even add to the work. <laughs> it was all about error and friction and, and all the things that, that, that I considered when, uh, when stopping buying cassettes. <laughs> all sure. years ago. Mm. And now I keep being given them. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, um, and the same goes for vinyl. I haven't, I've only, I only composed one piece for vinyl and that was actually for a lathe cut. Um, it was a, a commission in the UK in, um, in Somerset and it was the sounds from an old factory, an old twine making works. And so I retraced all the, the grooves that had been cut by years or decades of um, twine making. They'd cut their way through wood and metal and glass and things like that. And so I retraced with twine, with a contact mic, all these sounds, and then composed them into one long piece. That's lovely. 
And so, but it sounds like a, an old record, like the run-in of an old record. Right. So I basically created this record with these sounds that would also, after repeated playing, disappear. Mm. Because of it being a lathe cut, it's, it's actually a, a temporary object. Mm. So. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, no one bought it though. What's that one called? <laughs> <laughs> it's called uh, Trace Evidence. It was a lathe cut, so it, it was expensive. I, yeah. mean, I made 10 copies. Right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the organisation should there, but it is, it's on Bandcamp anyway. If you, if you want to imagine you're listening to it on vinyl, then it's there. Yeah, I'll, maybe I'll just sort of like slowly turn the volume down on, on, <laughs> yeah. on Bandcamp until eventually yeah, I can't hear it anymore. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. If anyone does see any of my work anywhere and, and doesn't want to or can't pay for it, just drop me a line and I'll send you the files, all right? I, I, I don't... I'd, I'd like to share my work. Very generous. Cheers. Excellent. Well, you've been, you've been extremely generous with your time as well, Simon. I didn't expect everyone to stick around for this long. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>